Your Bible Speaks Church uh, does more than just preaching and going to church and having a good time on Sabbath morning. And they do have a good time on Sabbath morning. Come up here. Let me hear what's going on down there. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Hey, we're here this morning from the YBS Church in Portland, Oregon, under the direction of uh, Pastor uh, Lewis Turner, Jr. And we're here today to tell you about our garden efforts. Well, my name is uh, Brother Michael. I have Brother Sister Marie and Elder Parrish. And we're going to be telling you about our, our uh, garden efforts. Uh, when I think about this, I think about the time when Paul was having some issues at one of his churches. And they were talking about, is Paul greater or is Silas greater? Or is uh, Cephas greater? And Paul said, no, we're not all greater than anybody. We're all just ministers of God. He said, one waters, another plants, but it's God who gives the growth. So as we go through this this morning, we ask that you keep that in mind. We're just ministers of the gospel and God who brings the growth. Amen? If we could uh, back that up to the... Well, we'll just go to our goals then. Our goals are just what's shown on the, on the screen there. To start an organic garden, and we started back in March 2013. As you can see, our, our okay. Our beginnings, <laughs> excuse me, were back in uh, at Susqueen, Washington, when uh, we sent church members there to visit that garden that the gardener had set up. The unique thing about this garden was it was made from wood chips. There's very little dirt or anything like that that's used in it. The gardener himself uses all the products that he has and all of the returns from his farms, and he uses that for fertilizer and to produce the, uh, the garden that he has. As you can see, there's no weeds or anything that's coming up, and it's very fertile. Now, with anything, you have to overcome some obstacles. And these are some of the obstacles that we had to overcome in order to go forward with what we were going to do. We were, had to overcome obstacles of people who doubted us, people who were hesitant to get involved and get action going. But all that was overcome by prayer and the faith, of, faith in God. All right, our goals, as I said in the beginning, were to start an organic garden. And we did that in March 2013. As you can see over on, uh, to the right, that was a garden area before we began. And you see that man that's in the picture there? That's Tom Hall. He was one of our elders. He was one of the key people who pushed this garden efforts. He worked very hard, very effort, very tirelessly to coordinate everything for us in order for us to bring this to uh, fruition. Our implementation will be carried on by Sister Marie. Good morning. My name is Marie Carter, and I just want to talk a little bit about our garden. I'm so proud of it. You know, um, from the beginning, and um, Brother Tom Hall had um, let us know about it, and, and um, we were very excited. It was about uh, nine to ten of us that say we're ready to get it done. And um, here you could see... You could see where the, um, the trucks, they came in to deliver the, the um, chips. And um, the first one is um, the trucks came in and then the, the people them that work on the, driving the truck, they came and, um, to help us with what was going on. And they delivered the, the um, chips. And um, you see on the bottom one there, we. We were able to get a, a tractor and um, to spread, to move them back to as far as we wanted. We were only using half of the, of the whole property, which is two, uh, two property. And we, um, all of us get together and we decided we we're going to spread these, these chips. And we work hard, we, especially on Sundays. We go there and we get our wheelbarrows and our rakes and stuff. And, and we were just busy. And there you can see when we started um, planting, we make rows. And this is all, 
all chips. When, when they put the chips, the, the rain, God bless us by letting the rain water the chips. And down at the bottom of the chips, we would make a, um, we'd make a, row, a row for the um, vegetables, and we plant the seeds then, and God did the rest. Uh, we didn't have to water them because the, the um, chips they were very soaked in the bottom of it. So we didn't have to water. And here you could see where the, um, the vegetables, they start growing. We had um, all these different vegetables. We had um, uh, the corn you'll see in the back had grew about um, 15 to 17 inches tall. That was our first. And we were so exciting and all the squash and, and tomatoes going all over the places, I'm telling you. And we had lots of string beans and greens and name it, we had it. And God has been so good to us and I'm so grateful what he has done for us. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Noel Paris. And uh, she did not tell you, but um, all the chips that, was, that is there was all donated to us. The guy with the truck that is dumping it, they all um, give it to us freely, uh, don't, uh, transport it to us freely. Now, last year, we did not have a shed to store uh, materials and stuff like that. Um, we approached the church for funding for this shed. Um, obviously, the way the economy is today, the board said, we do not have that money for you. But um, as dedicated to the program, um, the, the members decided to put the money together, and we got enough money to purchase the shed. Um, however, with the wisdom of um, Brother Tom, he decided that he's going to go to the local hardware store to see if we can see if this shed can be do donated to us. And he did that with, a, I think, one other person, and this shed was donated to us so that we can store our supplies. Amen. Also, these are the members, these are some of the members here in the pictures that are part of the, of the, um, of the group that is taking care of the garden. My, um, my picture is not there somehow. I, I think I was too busy. I wasn't feeling too good at the time that this picture was taken, so my, my picture is not there. Now this is, we do not have a greenhouse, but we use the shed as a place where we could um, start our plants. So you see different plants here. This is in the shed. And um, so we, we are getting along. Um, okay. Now the beauty of this, um, this waterless, this is a waterless garden. You put the chips down, you plant the seeds, and you do not have to water this garden. The moist stays right under the chips, and it waters the plants all year long. Even in the summer, you pull the chips, they're right there. I mean, the water is right there. Now, these, this is a picture of um, the last harvest. You can see there beautiful, um, beautiful green vegetables, cucumbers, many different vegetables we, we um, harvested last year. Now, Yes, this year we expect to even have a greater harvest by God's help. And I, I want to encourage you. Now, at a young age, I, I, I was taught how to grow crops. My dad, his father was a farmer. My dad, even though he was into the in construction work, he learned from his father at an early age. So at a young age, I knew how to plant and um, I neglected it, I know, at the, um, as I get older, but I realize the way things are today, the price for food. Now, the food that we plant in here, there's no sectorside, insecticide, it's all natural. And that's what we want for our bodies. So for further information, you can contact these numbers if you want to ha get an idea as to how to grow this garden, because you can do it right in your backyard. If you're tired mowing your lawn, just get the strips. Cover the lawn and plant the, the crops. Thank you. Amen. 
Oh, let's give them a... a that, this is wonderful. Wow. Yeah, uh, do you realize that in the beginning, God did not create Chicago? He did not create Seattle. He did not create Walla Walla. He created a garden. Called the Garden of Eden. Uh, you know, many Adventists are vegetarians. That means they eat Worthington and Loma Linda foods. If we want to really go back to Eden, we need to go back to gardening. Adventists should be the leader in the environmental movement. We save water. We get good plants, organic. We should be the leaders. Our name should be in the headlines. That is ministry, my friends. Praise God for the testimony that we have. But you know, the early church did many of these things. They healed. They took care of the poor. There was no one who had any need. But it also said they baptized. <laughs> on that first day, on that day of Pentecost, 3,000 persons were baptized. And then 5,000 and more and more came into the church. So while we celebrate healing, while we celebrate poverty, while we celebrate in heat and healthy, we praise God that we are also celebrating men and women, boys and girls, coming into the fold of Jesus Christ through baptism. So we want to hear those testimonies. Pastor Kevin, Bring your guest up here and let us hear that wonderful testimony of what God has done in the life of one of our sisters. Pastor Kevin Rogers. Good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm pleased to have with me here Sister Connie Lewis. Connie is a member of the Mount Tahoma Seventh Adventist Church, and um, I'm so happy that for what God has been doing in her life. Connie, could you just tell us a little bit about where you were, where you were born and where you were raised? I was uh, born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Um, raised in the uh, Church of Christ. Okay, okay. And tell me, what was your experience like? Uh, your spiritual experience like uh, when you were young? Uh, I was forced to go to church. You know, I. It was boring, um, just meaningless to me, but my mother was forcing me to go, so I went every Sunday. Okay. Just out of obedience to her. Just, just out of obedience <laughs> yes. to your mother? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. Um, we're not going to talk about what would happen if you didn't go, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but, but she took you. So, so now when you came to the point, like every child does, when, when, when you turn 18 and, or whatever age you were old enough to leave home, uh, what happened? Uh, I had already decided as a child that I was not going to serve God. That uh, as soon as I left my mother's house, I was going to do it my way. And uh, when uh, I left home, uh, I did it my way. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, not anything that I was taught. You know, my mother was, uh, my mother loved the Lord. She was a good example of a Christian woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I rebelled, mm -hmm. not realizing I was rebelling against God. And, you know, also. Uh, okay, so, so when you did it your way at the time, uh, how did that feel at the time? Well, was, it, was it fun? Well, like, I did a lot of things that brought me pleasure, but uh, mm -hmm. after a while, you know, I certainly was not happy. It didn't bring me happiness, and I was always seeking happiness. I always um, seemed to find a way to get a new car, or get a new clothes, and the things that, uh, you know, finest man I could find, you know. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, those things were, were pleasurable, but they, I was never happy. You know, the children, the houses, the, that material stuff, I just couldn't feel that void and I couldn't get enough of it. You know, so. so even though you were able to get what you wanted and you're successful in business and making money, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You still weren't happy? No, not okay. at all. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, how, but how long did that continue in your life? 
It continued for, for quite a while, most of my adulthood. Um, you know, it, it continued and one thing led to another and, and I didn't find it in, in material things, so I try to find it in substances, you know. Okay, to, to okay. Feel that void, just trying to feel that void. Okay, now eventually you came to the point where one night mm. you were at the end of your rope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Um, substances have a way of um, making you um, be okay for, for a minute, but uh, there comes a time when, you know, um, they, you come to the end of that, and uh, I felt like I would, I, I was so miserable, I was so unhappy in that, in that situation that I didn't want to live anymore. And that night, uh, in my living room, I had decided that um, I didn't know what, there was just nowhere else to go. I couldn't, I couldn't feel that void. I, I realized that I just could not do it. Mm. And this God who I had heard about all my life was pretty much a fairy tale. I had never experienced his presence. Uh, I took for granted that my mother provided, I provided, I did all of these things. Mm -hmm. And I had taken it for granted that, you know, things just were the way they were. Mm. But at this moment in my life, I, uh, I had uh, come to the end of my ropes and I, I, I said, you know what? I fell down on, on the floor and I said, you know, God, this God that I've heard about, if you're real, mm -hmm. I need you now. Mm. And I asked him to come into my life. And I knew how to act like a Christian because I had seen Christians, so. You've I, seen Christians or actors? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my mother was a Christian I, good, I have good. to give her that she was a good example uh -huh. and uh, so I decided that Christians go to church on Sunday mm -hmm. and so I got up the next day and with you know the, or just I started going to church on Sundays mm -hmm. and uh, I stopped partying on Saturday nights, but I still partied on Friday okay, okay. because I had to go to church on Sunday. Okay, and okay. so I started hanging around Christian people, you know, uh -huh, started uh -huh. acting like them and mimicking them, Okay. And but never really experiencing God in my life. Okay. And so when I um, um, began to, I, I still didn't feel God was real because it was, I had so many habits and so many things going on still. Okay, okay, yeah. that was still destructive. Right. Okay, okay. Yes. Now, at one point, you decided to move out here to Washington State yes. uh, from Arizona. Yes. And on that trip, what happened? I, I was driving uh, up the coast. I had my car packed with everything I could get in it, and I, I was just, just thinking if I left that environment, I would be okay. But mm -hmm. as I was driving up the coast, up through California, partied all the way. Uh, I got to Oregon and the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart and I began to realize this wavering in my life wasn't working. You know, what is, where is this God? But you know, I'm still wavering, you know? Mm -hmm. And so right as I got to the uh, Oregon, Washington state line, I prayed and I uh, promised myself and God that I was going to stop the wavering. I was going to serve God. I was going to surrender my life to him, you know. Mm -hmm. And still not knowing that I was still depending on my own strength, but God had another plan for me because I thought I had a job when I got here. Mm -hmm. And when I got here, the job fell through. Wow. And so here I am with no family, no friends around me all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. You know, I had always had my family and friends. Mm -hmm to fall back on, but I got here to Washington State and the job fell through and I ended up living with someone and that's something I had never done before. I've always had my own place, always mm. had the, everything I needed and all of a sudden I'm surrendering to God and I didn't have a nickel. Mm. I didn't know how I was gonna make it, you know? Mm. And at that point in time, I, I was really humbled. You know, I was really humbled and um, so I, I, I prayed more then and, and you know, I talked to God more then and I said, God, you know, I've heard about you. Mm -hmm. I heard you, you know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna keep trusting you. And during mm -hmm. those six to 
eight months that I didn't have anything and I learned to trust God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You started going to Christ the King Church in Federal Way. Yes. And, and, and you started to be exposed to people worshiping and all those kinds of things. And yes. you told me one time that that was kind of weird, you know, to see people <laughs> really experiencing God yes. and so forth. But, yes. um, um, and so um, at that point, um, um, what did God do in your life? Uh, I, was, I was praying and I was trusting him and really not reading the Bible, but just going to church and listening to, to what was being said, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, um, I always felt in church like a fish out of water. I felt like everybody in church had a halo on their head except for me. And if they knew my past, they would probably reject me yeah, and yeah. I would not be accepted. And so, you know, I carried a lot of pain. Uh, and uh, just hiding, you know. Okay, and okay. And then I went to church, and I would see everybody raising their hands and clapping and praising the Lord. And I never, never knew what that was really all about. But, okay. you know, uh, one Sunday I decided to raise my hands. And I decided that I, I was going to, you know, just raise my hands. And when I did, I felt the presence of the Lord come over me so, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, praise God for that. Now, listen, you had a time when um, you were involved in a relationship and things, and it, 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 uh, you kind of lost that sense of God's presence, right? right. And then you realized right. you need to get into the Word. Exactly. And around exactly. that time, um, you started looking at some special programs on TV. Yes. What was you looking? What did you look at? Yes. What got your attention? Uh, Walter L. Pearson. I didn't know he was a Seventh Day Adventist because my mother had always said, "Oh, those Adventists, you know, don't, you know, don't, you know, they're, they're not, they don't know the truth. They don't know what they're talking about." Uh -huh. Of course, I had never studied the Bible, so I believed what she said. Uh -huh. And so I was listening to uh, Walter L. Pearson, his teaching style. You know, he had gotten to where uh, I, I was just glued to the TV when I would hear his teachings. Mm -hmm. But I never knew that he was Adventist. And then. And uh, I started listening to him, and then Pastor Bird started coming on, and I saw that at Venice Church. I went, wow. Okay, okay. Yeah. And you have a, a sister in Virginia that is an Adventist. Yes. When she realized what you were doing, what, what did she start to say? Then she started calling me on the phone constantly, telling me, read this scripture, read that scripture, go here, go there. And I said, well, I'm going to ask my pastor. She said, no, 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 no. you got to find an Adventist pastor because he's not going to tell you what they, they'll tell you. And so <laughs> then I, I found a, a, a Bible worker, uh, Daniel Bennett, and me and him started studying together. And good, when good. I realized that uh, I was just following and not really mm -hmm. studying for myself, yeah, I, I began yeah, to, yeah. to study and uh, as I learned the truth. Okay. Okay, and then we, Mountain Woman Open Bible, had a revelation seminar yes. at King Oscar, yes. and you started coming. Yes. yes and yes. What, what was happening to you at that point? I, I was beginning to, to see the character of God and who he was, who he really was. Uh -huh. and, and, and as I, I learned for myself and studied and, and, and read for myself, I began to, to feel like I knew God. He was just not some faraway being. He became very Excellent, close. excellent. Yeah. Now, about six months after that, you got baptized. Yes. About two, which is about two years ago. Yes. It's right? Two years, my birthday. In May. Yes. Now, now, what has God been doing in your life since then? Well, uh, as uh, I was led to Mount Tahoma, uh, I got uh, a flyer, and it, it said uh, that the Daughters of Zion uh, were having a retreat, and I felt very uncomfortable going, and I didn't want to be, the, I didn't mm -hmm. want to go, but there was something inside me saying, go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, and uh, Mabel Dunbar was there, and she, she was doing this... Uh, she had this presentation, something she was doing there, this, this therapy session. I don't know what we call it, Mabel, but she, I raised my hand to answer a question, and uh, I thought it was some. I was going to talk about something I thought was in my past, but at that point, God revealed to me that, you know, even though I was experiencing his presence, his joy and, mm -hmm. and, and everything, uh, there was some healing in my, that I needed to, to mm -hmm. take to, in order to serve him. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, the abuse of my childhood abuse, the pain, mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that I was carrying with me, um, I needed to be healed from. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was an experience that helped me a lot. And, mm -hmm. and I was able to serve, I was able to usher. And uh, mm -hmm. without that mm -hmm. experience there at the uh, Daughters of Zion retreat, yeah. 
I, I came out of a shell. I, I was able to. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Currently, you've been involved in um, a, a healing group and prayer and renewal group at our church yes. for about a few weeks now. Yes, yes. And can you just end by sharing what God has been doing in your heart since during that? You know, again, like I, when I went to the retreat, I, I didn't think, I thought I had arrived. I thought, wow, I'm experiencing just joy and this peace and all of this stuff that, that I had never felt before. And um, this, when you called me and you said, you, you think I should be part of this group, I really thought, I said, wow, you know, he's got it all wrong. I'm okay. <laughs> but uh, as I started uh, in this healing group, uh, a lot of things have come out, and, and I'm, I'm just praising God because I'm free now. I'm free to serve. I'm free, you know, to, to be me and uh, who God has created me to be. And I realize that uh, the anger, the bitterness, the pain of my past, I can't carry that forward. God wants to use me. And uh, it's, it's just, I can't, I can't carry that anymore. I got to leave that with Jesus. Amen. Well, we praise God, Connie, Amen. for what he's been doing in your life. And we just want to pray right now for God to continue to bless you. Father, we praise you and thank you for the work of grace and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Connie's life. We ask you to continue to bless her, God, and grow her in you. Continue to heal and renew her heart and mind and use her to be a mighty witness for your glory and honor. We give you glory and praise for all you have done and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. Praise the Lord. Give a big amen on that. Wow. Praise God. You know, I began by saying there was this text in Matthew. It talks about going into all the world and make disciples. And I believe in going into all the world. Um, I'm an international person. And I remember taking my first group of students and faculty, including the president of the university in 1998, to the Philippines to hold an evangelistic meeting, baptized 1,200 people. Then I went to Ghana, and then I went to Tanzania, went to Jamaica, back to the Philippines, baptizing thousands of people. But then I said to make disciples of all people. And nobody was going to Thailand that had 90% Buddhists. And there you can't just pitch a tent and open the Bible and say the Old Testament say. You got to do a different type of ministry. And I'm very glad to know that there are many others that are doing this. For our 10th year, we are in Thailand, going next month for the 10th year. And we have a report from Uganda. Uh, come up here and tell us all the things that God has put on your heart to go into all the world, including Uganda, Africa. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, my name is Rosalind Schlatter, and I am a member of the Sharon Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our pastor says it's the best church in the world. Pastor Kevin Ramey, and I want to thank um, Pastor McCarthy for letting me give you this report. Um, I think it's... I think it's on the screen, the map of Africa. Uh, yeah. Um, so thank you for trusting me, Pastor McCarthy. Uh, he hasn't even heard my story yet. So um, I want to try and share with you my experience in words and photos. It can't really do it justice, what it's like to be in the heart of Africa. Um, I was walking around camp meeting at Gladstone one year, and I just had my fourth child, and she was in one of those front pouches. She was my little girl. Had three boys and then a little girl. And um, I came across the Maranatha volunteer booth, and um, I said to my husband, oh, I want to I wanna go on a mission trip. We should go on a mission trip. And he said, you can't go on a mission trip. You just had a baby. And so I said, okay, and quietly put it in the back of my head. And... Um, and just before Christmas last year, we came upon this little church that we used to visit. And a friend of mine, I like to call him Indiana Jones, his name is actually Ron Gladden. Um, his mission is Matthew 25, 40, which says, and this is the mission trip for Uganda. And the king shall answer and say unto them, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. And um, I feel like this is almost the least of us. Um, my dad was raised in Mississippi, and uh, I've been to the South, but I don't think I've ever seen poverty like I did in Africa. We flew from Portland to Chicago, from Chicago to Belgium, 
and then we flew to uh, where the little yellow star is. It's Kampala, Uganda. Um, from there, we drove about six hours to a village called Ntandi. And um, just to give you a picture, if you haven't been to Africa, um, the UNICEF commercials are real. That is a real picture. Um, that was our flight path. Each of us had a carry-on, each of us had a personal item, and each of us had two suitcases. So each of us, um, about eight of us from Portland, put in our two suitcases things for the children at the orphanage. There's 52 children at the orphanage. There's 650 children that attend um, because their children can't, or their parents can't care for them. So they come from the villages. Uh, let's see. Um, this is the team that I traveled with this time. Uh, I obviously am in the purple. And then next to me is a couple named Jim and Regina Hickey, and they own a construction business. Part of our trip in Uganda was to build a bridge. There's an, a campus, and enclosed on the campus is an orphanage with the school, but the water comes down between the two. And so the children are getting wet walking from the orphanage to the school. So part of that uh, effort was to build a bridge. The lady in the striped skirt is a dental hygienist, and she got to clean each of the orphan's teeth, not each of the children, not each of the 650 children, but the orphanage. Um, two of the orphans are HIV positive, and those two she wasn't able to um, assist in any dental cleaning because it would uh, release some uh, negative an uh, antibodies, uh, uh, a bacterial into their body. Um, and then the uh, lady in the uh, purple skirt, the other purple skirt, uh, she's a teacher, and she interviewed each of the 52 children. Um, she knows them by face and by name, and what she looked for each year as she goes is their progress in school. And that was wonderful. Um, so you ask, what was my job? Because I thought, well, what, what's going to be my job there? I'm not a dental hygienist, and I'm not a teacher, and I'm not uh, in construction. Um, and the Lord gave that to me, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. This is kind of what you see on the side of the road um, everywhere. Um, this is probably in Kampala, just a little shop that somebody's created. Even on the side of the road are baboons, and um, they're pretty dangerous, but they come out to the car, and we threw some M&Ms at them. <laughs> this is um, the administrative team for the orphanage. A lot of times it's very hard to um, trust people when you're sending money across 11 time zones. And these two gentlemen, this is Baluku in the red shirt and Enoch in the blue shirt, um, they are overseers of the orphanage and they live just across the road. This is the main gate of the orphanage. It wasn't always fenced, but what happened was people from the village were coming into the orphanage and because it was, it was so nice for the children according to their standards, they were staying on the campus and that took away from the education for the children. So this main gate and this fence was recently built. This is the, this is the actual orphanage itself. Um, it is split in two, girls on one side, boys on the other. Um, and that's a problem. The state is going to close the orphanage unless another building is brought up for the girls. Let's see here. This is the little church house, one of the church houses that they have. I visited several church houses and got to tell the children's story at a church on the Congo border. Um, I got to see five-day-old twins there. Um, it's just amazing what, what God can do um, and bring to you while you think that you're taking something to them. This is a, a playground here. Um, I remember yesterday when um, uh, Pastor Eugene and Jeanette uh, Lewis stood up and she said uh, what we were here to do this weekend was uh, to talk about what Jesus has done, what he can do, and what he can share to others through us. Um, so this is really my heart um, now that I got to travel and I hope to go back. There's a, another trip that we're going to take next year. And if you're curious at all, please come see me afterwards. 
Um, so again, our primary tasks were to build a bridge, um, the medical clinic, and uh, toothbrushes and floss for all the children. This is the medical clinic, which was very scarce. They were happy to have a suitcase full of Band-Aids. So your prayers are making a difference. Um, this is a little girl with malaria, and I'm really not sure that even the solution that she's being given is uh, sterile. Um, the kids need soccer balls. If any one of you wanted to give me a soccer ball, I will send it to Uganda. This is a ball of rags. It's not a soccer ball. So I've been written to by some of the children um, asking for soccer balls. Uh, this is a, a little baby who was just sitting, sitting in the dirt. And a friend of mine who I met there, her name is Christine, uh, I went towards the baby and looked around and there was no mother. And I said, what should I do? And she, go, she said to me, um, Rosalind, that is the same dirt and the same sand that I sat in and that my mother sat in. Um, and the baby's okay, go ahead and put him back. And the mom came. They'd never seen a tattoo before, so that was kind of interesting. This is the actual interview. So if you're picturing in your head an interview where um, we're sitting in an office, these are where the children are interviewed. This is the hand-powered trike. This is Miriam. We're trying to bring her on a medical visa. Um, she's 15 years old. She woke up at age five, and she was no longer able to walk. We took them soccer uniforms, um, and they help us unload the things for the bridge, so this was wonderful. We took them on a shopping trip, quote unquote shopping trip. This is me with seven boys. Um, I asked them to lead me around because I had no idea what I was doing. This was not a mall. Um, and so they led me around and they bartered. Um, after the shopping trip that day, I said to them, what, what um, do you guys really want? What do you want me to bring back to the orphanage? And um, Joseph Fatt, one of the boys who is HIV positive, um, came with me and he said, I'd, I'd like a couple of things. I'd like for my group six bowls, six cups, a loaf of bread, some sugar, and six green apples. And I just about lost it. It broke my heart because that's not what I'm used to hearing when I take children shopping. Um, so a mission trip to Uganda is a life-changing experience. Um, you extreme poverty, uh, you'll encounter, encounter poverty uh, conditions that you've never, ever, ever thought you'd see. Um, but God is so good because he gives to you way more than you, you're taking to them or you think that you're taking to them. You meet people in desperate situations and um, it's amazing to look into their eyes and they can see and believe that you care about them and that your love, the love that you're showing to them is real. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Wow. Uh, and give a good amen to that also. Amen. Pray, praise the Lord. You know, Walla Walla University is the leader in Adventism in sending students as student missionaries. We send out about 100 student missionaries that spend a year out there. You know what is culture shock? It's not leaving America to go out to the mission field. The culture shock is leaving the mission field and coming back home. And they see how we are so rich and increased in goods and going through Walmart and having everything. And that is what they left. And those people are happy and we are miserable. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to give good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to win souls to Jesus Christ, to do holistic ministry. We praise God for what he has done and for the testimony. Go thou and do likewise. Sing for us. The song, the song that we're going to sing right now um, is called uh, Rise Up and Shine, and it's in Oromo. Uh, it says, ye who are believers, who receive truths, 
who receive Jesus Christ, rise up and shine your light. Let nations know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life.
Kofi. Kofi is the president of the Walla Walla Black Student Fellowship in Walla Walla College Place. And uh, he has a project that I believe that you need to hear about and we need to support this young man. Kofi, come and tell us what you're trying to do there at the Berean Fellowship in Walla Walla University. Uh, let me first off say God is good and all the time. God is definitely good. I'm coming all the way from Walla Walla University, and I definitely have some good news for you all here. Uh, one thing at Walla Walla University, as I am in charge of the Black Student Christian Forum there and the Berean Leader, which is our African American worship experience, one of the things we decided to do is to create a scholarship. Because we know that though there's a lot of minority students that come there to Walla Walla University, get a great education, one of the things they struggle with is a lot of financial things, whether it's paying for tuition or other things. So what we decided to do as a club and as a ministry is that we wanted to create a scholarship where we can help students begin and finish and get a great education at Walla Walla University. Not only that, use whatever um, degree they get to have a great career and also use it in God's ministry. Amen? So to raise money for our scholarship fund, what we decided to do is that we created some paintings. As you can see here, uh, we brought about four paintings with us. We have one of Nelson Mandela, as you can see. We have one of Bob Marley. We have one of Maya Angelou. And we have one of Condoleezza Rice. So these are the four paintings that we have brought. And our plan or our goal is that this evening after Sabbath, um, what we want to do is that we want to auction off these paintings to raise money for this scholarship fund. So um, whatever amount that you want to donate for this Black um, Student Christian Forum scholarship, we will be gladly happy to accept it. And not only that, these paintings are so beautiful. Uh, you can put them in your office, your home, anywhere. So they're all going to be at the back. Um, after service, you see myself, Kofi, and you also see uh, my vice president here, Folu. And what we want to do is that we want you to reach deep down into your pockets and donate some funds towards our scholarship. So I want to thank you all for giving us this pleasure, and we pray that you all have a blessed Sabbath. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am very glad to come here I am from uh, Portland Seventh-day Adventist Oromo Church. God built us through Pastor McCarthy, 1997, July 26. From that time on, we are doing God's work. Thanks to the Lord. We are very glad to be with you, our people. So now it is time to pray. <clears throat> Lord, we are thankful for, for the time you give us to be together for the conference. Lord, bless each of us. Lord, bless the speakers. And also we who are listening to the speakers, bless each of us. 
and also teach us that we will walk, we will talk through your word. God be with us today, that the conference will be blessed. And also while we are going home, may you take care of us, that we will be success to go home also. Bless all of us. I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We had a wonderful Sabbath school, don't you agree?